The march, see what I did there, of scientific discovery continues in a dizzying variety of fields. So here's a selection of recent scientific discoveries for March of 2024. Number 10. Ending the Reentry Blackout One of the odd quirks of the space age is the communications blackout that occurs when manned spacecraft re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. The reason this happens is re-entry itself. As a capsule or spacecraft comes in, it slows itself by friction, decelerating as a result of it. This is good for slowing down, but bad for communications because an ionized plasma forms that basically creates a sheath that radio communications can't get through. This has been scary in the past because it leaves several minutes where you have no contact with the astronauts and no way to really know what's going on during that last phase of re-entry. If you take a SpaceX Crew Dragon, this can last for as long as 7 minutes. Interestingly, this effect is most famous for spacecraft, but also affects anything going very fast through the Earth's atmosphere over Mach 5, a problem for those designing various unmanned hypersonic systems. SpaceX, however, seems to think they have a fix for this persistent problem of the space age, in that they believe that instead of trying to send signals to the ground, the spacecraft might be more easily able to transmit them to space for relay back to the ground. SpaceX is currently testing this idea, but plasmas are very fickle in this regard, and it may need a lot more nuanced development. Number 9. Sensing Warmth with Prosthetics Prosthetics have come a long way over the last 20 years. While it's still a challenging field, with many different factors that affect how they can be used, one general trend has been to try to get them as close to the functionality of what was lost as possible. One holy grail here has been how to translate sensation from a prosthetic limb to the brain. While there has been progress on touch itself, a new device called MiniTouch now takes this closer in that it is fitted to existing prosthetic hands that allow the user to sense temperature, which has been a problem, both hot and cold, with high accuracy which actually allowed some enhanced ability to sense materials themselves. Users could also in some cases identify if they were touching someone's arm or an artificial surface. There remains much work and advancement to do before a truly perfect prosthetic can be produced, but any advancement is a welcome one. Number 8. Cosmic Dust May Have Played a Role in Abiogenesis One of the great mysteries in trying to figure out how life arose on Earth has been the problem of Earth being relatively poor and certain elements needed for biochemistry. It was unclear how Earth accumulated materials like phosphorus and sulfur, but one idea that was largely discounted in the past has made a comeback. It's that the materials were delivered by the constant rain of cosmic dust that falls to Earth. The reason this was previously discounted is that as a whole, not enough cosmic dust accumulates in any one area of the Earth to account for it, even though there was much more of it in the past. Meteor showers on early Earth must have been spectacular. Until recently, however, this has led the focus to look for larger meteorites that can deliver larger amounts of these materials at once. But there were problems with that idea as well in that it seems that you need a constant supply, which meteorites just don't provide in any one place on Earth. Recent simulations have solved this issue in that the researchers were able to show that dust falling on glaciers can be conveyed to melt zones where the materials can accumulate and melt ponds at the edge of a glacier, providing the concentrations that life would need to get going. Unfortunately, however, it's also unclear whether early Earth during the time of abiogenesis occurring even had glaciers. Number 7. Transmitting Power from Space One of the issues with solar energy is that it cannot be generated 24-7, due firstly to nightfall and secondly cloud cover, meaning that it is an imperfect but important power source here on Earth. But it's been envisioned for many decades that space-based solar power generation would defeat both of these problems and turn solar into a permanent, uninterrupted power generation resource. The problem of deploying such a system has been twofold. Firstly, you have to build a large enough solar panel to be meaningful, but still small enough to be launched on a rocket, 
And second is the issue of getting the power down to the surface of the Earth. One way of getting past the size problem is to assemble the structure in space using many flights, or alternatively sending up a constellation of many energy collectors. As to beaming power, recent experiments at Caltech have for the first time achieved this by building a system that generates microwaves and beams them very specifically to a point on Earth. The amount was very tiny, just 100 milliwatts of energy, but they did indeed receive the power on the ground, though in a much weakened state. For a viable system, producing about 100 megawatts, eventually a structure could be built that would be about one square kilometer in size to collect solar energy for beaming back to Earth. But that it can be done at all has now been shown. These are the very first baby steps of eventually building a Dyson Swarm. Number 6. The Scarred White Dwarf A white dwarf is essentially the cooling ashes of a former normal star. Indeed, a white dwarf ending is what's in store for the sun. It will basically cool in this state for 10 billion years or so until it loses enough heat to be a cinder or black dwarf. Not a huge amount happens during this phase, but a newly discovered white dwarf shows how dynamic they actually can be. Known as WD, 0816-310, this newly studied white dwarf shows what really can be only described as a giant metallic blemish on its surface. The star is in a class of white dwarf known as polluted white dwarfs, where metals are found. But they typically are distributed evenly across the white dwarf. This is thought to be the remnants of planets that have fallen into the white dwarfs. And that's probably what this blemish is but it's not evenly distributed. It seems clear that whatever is causing the material is being funneled into this spot by the white dwarf's magnetic field. Here a small planet, probably a large asteroid actually, was relatively recently devoured. Oddly, this sort of spray of torn apart asteroid might give us further clues on the composition of that asteroid in another star system entirely before it was destroyed. Number 5. Making Glass Fiber on Mars Mars is often cited as a harsh place. The book and subsequent movie The Martian depicted the protagonist using the Martian soil to grow food and eke out survival. This was later a problem discovered, however, when the Martian soil was found to contain perchlorate, which is a problem for a growing medium, though the soil can be washed to remove it. Now there may be a better option, and it may be multi-use. Researchers in China took recreated Martian soil and heated it to see if it could be made into fibers, much like what was done on Earth with glass fiber. It turns out the Martian soil can make good fiber, and if used structurally, matches steel, allowing for a much more efficient way to create strong structures on Mars than transporting steel there, or collecting up iron meteorites, or setting up mining facilities. But this fiber can also be used as a growing medium on Mars, because it actually holds water better than the unadulterated Martian soil does. And you can even make clothing with it. I'd say a t-shirt made from Mars would sell well if exported back to Earth. Number 4. Seaweed as a tool to help mitigate disaster Natural or human-caused disasters are certainly still possible in the modern age, more so today in certain regards. We are still under threat from catastrophes such as nuclear war or an asteroid impact. It's always been rightly assumed that these are at least near extinction level events, or they are extinction level events. If you release enough material one way or another into the atmosphere of Earth, it's been known for a very long time that large-scale agricultural collapse will follow. Not enough sun, not enough plants. With nuclear winter, it's estimated that agriculture would decline by 90% within one year. Global temperatures will drop dramatically, and most importantly, sunlight will be blocked to a large degree. But there are people that think about these things, and recent work has shown that one edible food source that wouldn't be so severely affected is seaweed. Networks of basically ropes attached to buoys could be deployed in certain parts of the Pacific Ocean that could grow up to 15% of the current food supply, along with animal feed and biofuels. That may not sound like much, but it would save a lot of lives from starvation in a world with an already dramatically contracted population. 
along with preserved agricultural capabilities in the tropics, which would still have enough warmth and light. Such a horrible, horrible prospect, such as war or an asteroid impact's effects, to some degree might be mitigated in the aftermath. Number 3. A New Record for Volcanic Eruptions About 7,300 years ago, off the coast of the Japanese island of Kyushu, the largest volcanic eruption of the current Holocene Age happened. That we know of anyway. This newly discovered eruption is estimated to have produced over three times as much volcanic ash as the largest known historically recorded eruption, which was Mount Tambora in 1815. This eruption was previously known, other than its scale, but ash deposits and archaeological work showed that humans living nearby were dramatically affected. Recent studies by researchers in Japan have shown that this volcano turned 70 cubic kilometers of rock into ash and threw it into the atmosphere. While this blast seems titanic, it's only the largest known one for the Holocene. If you go back further, there is the Toba supervolcano about 74,000 years ago that was orders of magnitude larger, producing 2,500 cubic kilometers of magma. This new find, however, known as the Kikai Akahoya caldera, still is a hot magma chamber beneath it. And while it's thought that the chances for an eruption today are very small, it's not impossible that someday it may become active again. Number 2. Bennu may have originated from an ocean world. In September 2023, the OSIRIS-REx sample return mission brought material from the asteroid Bennu back to Earth. Bennu is an interesting asteroid because it's carbon rich. Not unlike certain meteorites found on Earth that are similarly carbonaceous and have links to life on Earth, often containing amino acids, the building blocks of life. The Bennu samples were wildly successful. The aim was to return about 60 grams of material from the asteroid, but the actual haul turned out to be twice that. Not all of the results are out, but initial findings include that the samples contain clays, and specifically minerals, called serpentinites. Here on Earth, these minerals form because of water. Basically, material pushing up from the mantle gets exposed to water, and these minerals are the result of the resultant chemical action and the heat that it generates. Weirdly, the samples also contain phosphates, rich in calcium and magnesium, that are actually also seen in the plumes of Enceladus. This is all pointing to Bennu having originated in a planetesimal, one of the tiny minor planets that once populated the solar system and now make up the main planets through relentless collisions in the early solar system. The one Bennu originated from may well have been some type of small ocean world, perhaps not unlike Enceladus but likely much smaller. Also found were oil-like inclusions, called nanoglobules, that resemble something like the beginning of a protocell wall. This is not a candidate for life, however. Rather, it's a sample of what early Earth might have been like, and the rocks falling on it, that is not contaminated by Earth life. Life has changed our planet dramatically, so we don't really have any samples of Earth before life, but Benno seems to give us clues as to what that was like. Number 1. We may have forced the Moon into a new geologic epoch. The Moon's surface is as geologically unchanging as it gets. It no longer sports the once great volcanic resurfacing events that poured across its surface and created the familiar lunar maria that we see from Earth. Those days are gone, and even smaller volcanic activity has, as far as we know, almost entirely ceased. Most of the action that happens on the Moon these days is the result of the activities of the solar system itself. Meteorite impacts and meteoroid-driven lunar gardening ever so slowly pulverizing the surface. But the moon may not be so dead anymore. It may have just entered a new geologic phase. And it's our fault. On Earth, human activity is so prevalent and affects the planet so much that we've defined our current age as the Anthropocene. Some researchers suggest we need to do the same with the moon. The idea is this. We've been landing on the moon for a very long time, since 1959, when the Soviet Luna 2 mission intentionally impacted the surface. And it's been nothing but more missions since, including Apollo and now NASA's planned return to the moon. 
Lunar visitation is hot these days, with multiple countries now including India and China now in the game of lunar surface exploration. And Russia is planning a return. Even private companies have entered the market. Make no mistake, humans are returning to the moon in force. While our footprint, pun intended, on the moon is still very small, it still locally far exceeds what the solar system's bombardment can do to change the surface of the moon. To date, we've disturbed the surface over 59 times and counting, and this is not likely to stop. Eventually, things like colonization and mining will disturb vast areas of the moon, and it'll be a question of international agreement to perhaps leave some areas pristine. All of this seems to amount to one thing. The moon is now in its own version of the Anthropocene Age. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently advocating that we avoid changing the face of the moon that we see. It would be a shame to change the face of something humanity has gazed upon for our entire existence. The far side, however, game on. I want to put a giant SETI radio telescope there. Be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channel for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.